Uh, I call this hearing to order and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. And I'd like to begin as we always do now to note some important requirements. Uh, let me begin by saying that the standing House and committee rules and practice will continue to apply during remote proceedings. House regulations require that members be visible throughout through a video connection throughout the proceeding. So please keep your cameras on and remain muted until you're recognized to minimize background noise. In the event a member encounters technical issues that prevent him or her from being recognized for their questioning, I'll move to the next available member of the same party and I'll recognize that member at the next appropriate time slot provided they have returned to the proceeding. Should a member's time be interrupted by technical issues, I'll recognize that member at the next appropriate slot for the remainder of their time once their issues have been resolved. In the event of technical issues, I may need to recess the proceedings to address them. And with that, let's turn to today's business. I wanna thank all of our witnesses for being here today. It's a pleasure to have such a talented and accomplished group of witnesses representing the arts sector. As you can see, I'm sitting in for Chairwoman Velasquez, who is unable to chair this hearing today. Uh, the arts sector, an important sector, employs nearly 5.2 million Americans and contributes $919 billion to our national economy. In my congressional district, the influence of the creative economy is all over the place. Writers, photographers, musicians, and designers launch small businesses, employ workers, and help Minnesota make it great through their art. But the impact of the arts economy is not confined to America's largest cities. It is evident in every part of the country. America's 675,000 art-centered businesses are present in every congressional district throughout the nation. Unfortunately, the pandemic has touched every business in the arts economy. Creative businesses and workers usually rely on in-person gatherings and live events to sustain their enterprises. However, as the virus spread throughout the country, leading Americans led Americans to stay home and socially distance. 99% of entertainment productions canceled events throughout the pandemic so far, resulting in a loss of $557 million in ticketed admissions alone. At the height of the pandemic, 63% of creative workers experienced unemployment and 95% lost creative income. The live events industry is a crucial component of the creative economy that has struggled greatly throughout the pandemic. This industry compromises not only theaters and music venues, but also musicians and performers and those that support live events, such as planners, caterers, designers, and so much more. These workers and small businesses have seen precipitous declines in revenue due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and related public health concerns, with countless events and gatherings being canceled or delayed for now the third year in a row. To help mitigate that impact of the pandemic on this industry, Congress created the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program, known as SVOG, as many have come to know it. To date, the program has delivered over $13 billion in grants to struggling venues throughout the country. This funding has helped many businesses, including several in my district, avoid permanent closure. However, SVOG was not accessible to many independent contractors and small business owners that comprise the broader live events industry leaving them totally out in the cold. Last August, I held a listening session with business owners in the live events industry in Minnesota and heard heartbreaking stories of dreams delayed and hardships faced. And five months later, Congress is yet to take further action. <clears throat> it is crucial that we pass additional small business targeted relief to help those small businesses <clears throat> most impacted by the growing ongoing pandemic, including those in the live events industry itself. These funds would help business owners keep their doors open and workers employed and would help strengthen our economic recovery as well. With the understanding that arts and culture are the second highest sector for value added per dollar in the United States economy. It is important to note as well, the benefits of the arts go well beyond economic. They have substantial impact on our country's social, civic and cultural well-being. Alongside preserving and celebrating culture, research shows that as creative and artistic enterprises arise, ancillary businesses are more likely to form around them, creating more jobs and stimulating more local economies. But the wounds of the pandemic inflicted on the arts economy are deep and painful and potentially long lasting. If we wish for the industry to return to pre-COVID trends and continue to be an economic engine for local communities, these businesses need more support and investment. 
Investing in the creative economy will help this crucial sector recover while also fueling overall economic growth for the United States. So today, I hope this hearing allows us to examine these challenges uh, of those operating in the creative economy uh, continue to face. I also look forward to discussing policies that can help support this important sector to all of us. With that, I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Lukemeyer, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you filling in for the uh, chairwoman this morning. As COVID-19 continues to disrupt daily lives, we've seen Americans double down on their cultural and creative consumption to regain a sense of normalcy. In addition to the creative arts ability to provide individuals with comfort, joy, and even hope during the challenging times, uh, the arts can also ignite economic growth and recovery after hardship strikes. <clears throat> creative organizations and enterprises are revenue and job generators, not only within their immediate sphere, but also act as a catalyst, stimulating economic activity in ad adjacent sectors, such as tourism, hospitality, transportation, restaurants, and many others. Culture and the arts are not are confined only to metropolitan areas. In fact, rural and heartland communities also have their own significant reservoirs of homegrown creative assets that can be mobilized for social, cultural, and economic good. Nationwide, the creative economy generated an impressive 4.3% of our nation's gross domestic product, or $919.7 billion in 2019. The creative arts employed nearly 5.2 million workers prior to the pandemic, accounting for nearly 3.3% of the United States workforce. Unfortunately, this industry has not been immune to the COVID-19 crisis. During the worst of the pandemic, nearly all entertainment events were canceled, triggering significant financial losses across the board for the businesses themselves, local governments, and adjacent businesses reliant on their success. At the same time, un un uh, employment in this sector plunged, and while there has been some increase, workers in the creative arts sphere remain among some of the most heavily affected, with 11% lower unemployment rates than compared to pre-pandemic levels. <clears throat> 2021 ushered in a tentative rebound in the creative sector over the past year. However, there are several major stressors th threatening to reverse this fragile recovery. The Omicron variant of the coronavirus threatens to usher in a new wave of closures and restrictions devastating to arts industries reliant on human interaction. The meteoric rise in inflation is manifesting in higher supply costs, threatening businesses whose financial capital is already severely strained from weathering a two-year pandemic wage hikes, and rents locking in at higher prices. Unlike large businesses who may have deeper re financial reserves, small businesses are often financed by owners' personal savings, placing them in grave personal financial risk during periods of high inflation. <clears throat> Increased inflation means less buying power, which in turn translates to a decreased ability to hire and retain qualified employees. Unfortunately, with last week's consumer price index reading of 7%, and the wholesale inflation rising to 9.7% year over year, a challenging economic environment for small businesses will continue. Unlike other industries who may be able to take advantage of automation and technology to replace people, the creative arts rely, on, rely deeply on human skill and ingenuity. As a sitting member of Congress and ranking member of this committee, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome our witnesses today. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'd like to thank all of you for participation. I look forward to your conversation. Um, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lukemeyer. And I'd like to take a moment to explain how the hearing will proceed. Each witness will have five minutes to provide a statement, and each committee member will have five minutes for questioning. Please ensure that your microphone is on when you begin speaking, and that you please return to mute when you're finished. And now I'd like to introduce our witnesses for the day. Our first witness is Mr. Carson Elrod. Mr. Elrod has been a fierce, activi fierce activist in the creative sector, most notably as a co-founder and co-leader and director of government affairs for Arts Workers United, Be an Arts Hero. Arts Workers United is an arts advocacy organization dedicated to establishing the arts and culture sector of the United States by means of support, investment, and representation. When he's not championing for arts and culture workers, Mr. Elrod is a professional actor who has appeared in live theater, motion pictures, on Broadway, and much more. We welcome you, Mr. Elrod. Our second witness is Ms. Nataki Garrett, a change maker and trailblazer. Ms. Garrett is a nationally recognized director and the sixth artistic director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, OSF. The first woman to artistically lead a $44 million theater company and OSF's first black female in the role. Prior to her role at OSF, she served as our acting artistic director at the Denver Center Theater Company 
as well as Associate Dean and the co-head of the undergraduate acting program at Kyle Arts School of Theater. We welcome you, Ms. Garrett. Our third witness is Ms. Sandra Karras. Ms. Karras has married her passion of arts and advocacy, serving as the secretary treasurer of Actors' Equity Association, the union of professional stage actors and stage managers in the United States. She's a licensed tax and finance attorney and serves as the director of the New York City Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. Sits on the board of directors of the New York Local of Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, and is even an actor herself. We welcome you, Ms. Karras. And now I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Luke DeMeyer, to introduce our final witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness is Ms. Rianne Presley. She is the co-owner of Presley's Country Jubilee Theater and Branson Visitor TV. Presley's Theater is a multi-generational family-owned business and is the original live music theater in Branson, Missouri, hosting its first show on June 30th, 1967. In addition to being a small business owner, Ms. Presley is a devoted community leader. She became the first woman elected mayor of Branson in 2007 and went on to serve four terms, having previously served, served as Branson City Council Alderman for 10 years. Prior to her government service, Ms. Presley was chair of the Missouri Tourism Commission and served in leadership positions on several community boards, including as chair of the Board of Directors of Skaggs Community Hospital, Board of Directors of Springfield and Branson National Airport, and the Branson Lakes Area Chamber of Commerce. Due to her hard work and exemplary leadership skills, Ms. Presley was honored as a recipient of the Missourian Award in 2009. In addition to representing her own views as a small business owner, Ms. Presley is here representing the National Independent Venues Association, or NEVA, formed in mid-April of 2020 in response to the ill effects of, COVID, of the COVID pandemic. NEVA's members include many small independent venues, promoters, and festivals across the entire nation. Ms. Presley, it's a pleasure having you testify before this committee. Look forward to your value insights. I know you'll provide today. Um, it's good to see you again. Uh, Ms. Presley and I, just for um, um, clar clarification purposes, uh, uh, worked together when I was the Division of Tourism Director in the state of Missouri, and she was a leader in the Branson area for all of the different uh, tourism activities and, and uh, venues there. So it's great to see you again, uh, Rianne, and welcome to the committee. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. We're going to expect you to sing a song, Mr. Ranking Member. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to have to send everybody off the uh, off the hearing. For short hearings. <laughs> anyway, for thank sure. you, sir. And... Uh, uh, thank you to all our witnesses for being here today. And with that, uh, I now recognize Mr. Elrod uh, for your opening statement for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Chairman Phillips, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, esteemed members of the Small Business Committee, thank you so much for your invitation to join today's groundbreaking hearing. I am an arts worker, I'm a professional actor, and one of the 5.2 million Americans that animate our creative economy. Arts workers like me support over 673,000 businesses, many of them small, that add $919 billion in value to our nation's economy. That is five times more than agriculture and nearly 300 billion more than all of transportation. We're big business because we are local business from Kansas to Kentucky and Alaska to Alabama. Every state in the union is home to tens of thousands of arts workers whose labor contributes more than a billion dollars to each state's GSP. Our arts institutions are like stars that anchor a dynamic solar system of ancillary businesses. You build a theater or a museum and you can watch hotels, restaurants and other small businesses grow up around them. The socioeconomic light of our creative businesses strengthens communities and stimulates their economies. Our nation's creative economy is in peril. In January of 2020, I had just been cast in a role on a television show that promised to be a game changer for me, both professionally and financially. On March 13th, 2020, that job evaporated and I joined 2.7 million of my fellow arts workers for 15 months of total unemployment. During this time, I joined Brooke Ishibashi, Jenny Grace, Mac Holman, Matthew Lee Erlbach, and starting BN Arts Hero and Arts Workers United to relentlessly campaign for federal relief, recovery, and a hearing just like this one. I was grateful to Congress for the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program, but even as the pandemic persists, that pandemic relief, like my jobs, has evaporated. And without union work, I lost my union health insurance. For the first time in my life, I am on Medicaid. My last show got canceled because I, with my cast, caught COVID. I had an upcoming show this spring. It has been canceled because of COVID. My story is not unique. 
while I had some savings and the privilege to dedicate my life to this advocacy, so many, especially in the BIPOC, LGBTQIA plus and disabled communities have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic and they do not have it as good as I do. And I think I have it pretty bad. I'm still haunted by a conversation I had with Patsy Baressa from the Sims Foundation in Austin, Texas. They provide mental health services for music workers. In just one month, four of their clients became so hopeless that they killed themselves. We can't let the human infrastructure of our creative economy vanish into other industries or worse. The loss to our families, our culture, our communities, and future generations and the economy would be incalculable. Arts workers should be the backbone of our post-COVID recovery. The creative economy is a jobs multiplier with a normal growth rate of 4.45%. That's nearly double that of the rest of the economy. And the human need to gather, to find community, to share cultural experiences will be enormous after this pandemic. Congress can translate that need into strategic investments that will jumpstart the American recovery built on imagination, innovation, creativity, and community. To accomplish this, I do recommend that Congress com uh, commission a GAO report to fully explore what Congress can and should do to stabilize and stimulate the creative economy. Ensure that unemployed American arts workers retain unemployment benefits so that arts workers can stay arts workers. Immediately pass the Performing Arts Tax Parity Act, the CREATE, the PLACE, the HITS Act, the Arts Education for All Act, the Creative Economy Revitalization Act, and the 21st Century Federal Writers Project. Finally, Congress should work with the president and create a secretary of arts and culture. You have the opportunity to ignite not just a sunrise, but a supernova of creative small businesses, triggering a chain reaction of such socioeconomic prosperity that history will remember this Congress as the Congress that provided the rocket fuel needed to launch us into the new American century, defined by the incredible specialized labor of American arts workers and the 21st century American creative economy that they drive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Elrod. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Ms. Garrett for five minutes for your opening statement. Ms. Garrett. Thank you very much for recognizing me. Chairwoman Velasquez, Representative Phillips, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, and the members of the committee. I wanna thank you for inviting me to appear before you today. I am the Artistic Director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, otherwise known as AOSF. I am honored to be with you and share how COVID-19 has affected the art sector, specifically OSF, to highlight our economic and social impact and to offer ways Congress can support the recovery of the creative economy. Founded in 1935, OSF is a member of the National Theater Communications Group and the Performing Arts Alliance. Prior to the pandemic, we were a $44 million flagship nonprofit theater and one of the largest economic drivers of the Southern rural, uh, rural Oregon economy. In a typical year, we welcomed over 400,000 people from all over the world to the town of Ashland, Oregon, a town of 20,000 people that has the same density of restaurants and hotels per resident as New York and Paris. OSF generates more than a quarter billion dollars of economic activity in the region annually, and we're responsible for a full 20% of its economic activity overall. Simply put, the arts are a powerful economic engine that drives our region. In March of 2020, we had just opened our season, my first as artistic director. Within six days of opening, COVID forced us to short, shut it all down. We had already spent about 20 million to get the shows ready for the stage and patrons had uh, paid more than 6 million for tickets that had to now be refunded. And over the next few weeks, 90% of OSF's nearly 500 employees, including actors, crew members, carpenters, box office staff, craft artisans were laid off. 829 performances of our 11 scheduled productions were shuttered and 2,300 community engagement and education events were canceled. Within a month, we laid off 500. That 500 led to 5,000 in our town and 20,000 across the region. In September of the same year, the Alameda fire swept through the region and destroyed more than 2,000 homes and businesses, including the homes of some of the remaining OSF employees. We set up a food bank, provided emergency housing, and dedicated a significant part of our annual gala to the relief effort. I am haunted by the choices I had to make to keep OSF afloat. 
but it's even more difficult for the culturally specific and smaller venue or community-based arts organizations and their arts workers. Their work has a huge impact on the creative economy and often goes under resource. I think about the hundreds of thousands of artists around this country who drive so much of our economy, but themselves live in poverty. How can we continue viewing an industry that makes up more of our GDP than agriculture and mining combined as a luxury or a purview of the elite? How do we look at millions of arts and culture workers in this country in the eye and not take simple, simple common sense steps to simultaneously make their lives and our economy more secure and robust? How can we continue cutting arts programs in schools when we know that students who participate in arts education are more likely to go to college and less likely to go to jail? The reality is that the infusion of federal dollars along with the generosity of our donors and patron is without that, it was, it's likely that I would not be here today because OSF would not be here today. I'm very thankful for the assistance this committee provided through the Shuttered Vineyard Operators Grant Program, formerly known as SOS and other forms of COVID relief. At OSF, we have a tradition. Following the curtain call of our last outdoor play, each season, every person in the company carries a candle and silently enters a darkened theater to the strains of Greensleeves. A veteran company member speaks Prospero's speech from Act Four, scene one of The Tempest. It's like a prayer. Our revels now have ended. It's a promise. 1,200 audience members from all walks of life hang on every line. The candles are extinguished and the company silently and reverently exits the theater. It marks the ending of a season of hard work and beautiful art making and the promise that those house lights will be rekindled once more. In 2020, I was afraid that those candles had gone out forever, but I'm here to tell you that we will make sure that the creative economy endures. As an artistic director, I am committed to ensuring that those candles burn bright and those words are spoken for years to come. The power you hold, you can ensure the flickering candle of the creative economy can continue to burn brightly. Right now, bills such as the Creative Economy Revitalization Act and the Performing Arts Parity Act and the Arts for Education for All Act, bipartisan bills that positively uh, impact the economies of every state and enjoy broad public support are waiting for Congress to act. It's not a radical act, nor is it controversial. It's recognizing a simple fact that the arts and the artists drive local economies and at the same time lift people out of darkness. Thank you for this time and thank you for what you will do next. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Garrett. And now I'd like to recognize Ms. Karras for five minutes for your opening statement. Ms. Karras. Chairman Phillips, Ranking Member Ludkemeyer, thank you for the invitation today. I'm Sandra Karras, an actor, Secretary Treasurer of Actors Equity Association and a member of SAG-AFTRA's New York Local Board. I also appear before you as a small business owner. I'm a tax attorney, accountant, and a financial advisor with a practice here in New York. You are hearing today about the power of the creative economy and the live arts in particular, rightly so. The arts and culture sector is responsible for 5.2 million jobs and 4.3% of the GDP. The live arts have a huge halo effect on small business, many of which would not exist without the arts. Patrons spend on restaurants, parking, taxis, hotels, childcare. Nationally, that's more than $100 billion in additional spending. The creative economy drives revenue growth for business and workers. The reason? Unions. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of Actors Equity Association, the union of actors and stage managers in the live theater. Our members work across the country, from Los Angeles' 99-seat nonprofits to Kansas City's Starlight Theater and the St. Louis Rep, to Buffalo's Cavanoke Theater and the Winter Garden on Broadway, and everywhere in between. Our contracts include health care and pensions. As the original gig workers, we are the proof that companies need not choose between profits and W-2 employee protections. The pandemic has indeed created a crisis. While many businesses have recovered, the new variant has brought tremendous uncertainty and job loss in the live arts one. Once again, in just the last few have closed and virus, earnings and health insurance were put at risk. When live events close, the small businesses that depended on them also feel the crunch. There's one way you can help all of us arts workers. Congress has the opportunity to pass the Performing Artist Tax Parity Act, or PATPA, which modernizes a provision enacted by President Ronald Reagan and will provide relief to entertainment workers. 
Performing artists pay a high percentage of their income on necessary out-of-pocket costs to look for work and stay current in the industry. We pay agents and managers, transportation to auditions, maintain our websites, headshots, video reels, and more. It can amount to 20 to 30% of our gross income. Previously, this was deductible. Because of an unintended consequence of tax reform, we lost the deductions of our unreimbursed business expenses. This means a tax increase, often of thousands of dollars for working class artists. I've seen heartbreaking stories at the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program here at our equity office, where volunteers process thousands of free tax returns annually for low-income arts workers. One young taxpayer, upon learning that his liability increased by more than 30%, wondered aloud how he was going to pay his rent. As we return to work, the last thing we need is a tax code that punishes us for seeking work. This bill is targeted to low income and middle class taxpayers, not the high earning stars. I commend representatives Chu and Buchanan for leading the effort to pass this bill in the house. Thank you also to representatives Newman and Garbarino for co-sponsoring. I ask you all for your support. PATPA is equity's top legislative priority and it is endorsed by unions and employers, but it is not our only priority. We also released a federal policy agenda for inclusion in the arts in partnership with our fellow arts unions. The National Endowment for the Arts should create a chief diversity officer to drive inclusion deeper into the grant process. And we strongly support the Crown Act to end hair discrimination in our industry. On behalf of all the arts unions, I want to thank the Small Business Committee for helping to make sure that unions were treated fairly during the pandemic by allowing access to the Paycheck Protection Program. Our staff worked harder than ever, and this program was a lifeline to them and to our employers. I will conclude today where I started. The arts sector is a robust contributor to our national economy because of a strong union presence, not in spite of it. In an industry where competition is keen and there are more workers than jobs, we ensure workers have a voice in their workplace, secure standards and safe working conditions. That's why the PRO Act has our full support. It will reform outdated labor laws and protect against exploitation and employee misclassification, which is unfortunately far too common in our industry. It will help the arts and culture sector and workers prosper into the next century. That is the true promise of the creative economy. I thank you for the privilege of appearing before you today. Thank you, Ms. Karras. And now Ms. Presley, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Phillips, Ranking Member Luke Tamire, and distinguished members of this committee. Thank you for inviting me to add my voice to today's hearing. My name is Rayanne Presley and I join you from my home in Branson, Missouri. I am co-owner of Presley's Country Jubilee, along with my husband, Steve, and in-laws, Gary and Pat Presley. As a former Mayor Branson and former chair of the Missouri Tourism Commission, I can attest that family-friendly entertainment and the creative spirit is at the heart of our community. In 1967, the Presley family opened the original show on Highway 76. Lloyd and Bessie Presley, along with their four children, dreamed of entertaining the fishermen and families with wholesome comedy and music. Opening Branson's first live music theater on a small, unpopulated two-lane road was risky, but the Presley family was passionate about entertainment and determined to make their living at it. They exemplify the entrepreneurial spirit that drives our industry and help to build our city. This March, Presley's will open our 56th season. Our 1,500-seat theater, which started with folding chairs, has expanded nine times over the years. We now employ 70 people, produce more than 200 events each year, and have a weekly television show averaging 300,000 viewers. Our pre-show features a gospel sing-along in our mezzanine, ushers to take you to your seat, Coke, popcorn, and cinnamon nuts to enjoy. The heart of our show remains the same, to provide lifelong family memories and opportunities for folks to forget their troubles for a time. Many Branson venues, including Presley's, we're fortunate to receive shuttered venue operator grants and PPP loans. We are grateful to our elected leaders, especially co-sponsors, Representative Williams of this committee, Representative Welch, and so many of you who've recognized that our industry matters. Without your support for the Save Our Stages Act, I might not be here today to tell you about the challenges we face beyond the pandemic. 
So let me just make sure to say thank you for this lifeline for our industry. The reaction of our audience when we reopened show, showing just how much people need live entertainment. When the curtain went up on that opening song, the audience stood for a sustained standing ovation. I heard similar stories from venues coast to coast. Our economy also needs live entertainment. A 2019 study showed that for every dollar spent at a small venue, $12 of economic activity was generated. While Branson's population is just over 12,000, our theater and music industry employs nearly 2,000 people and helps to bring an estimated 8.2 million visitors to our region each year. Nationally, more than 80% of adult travelers can be considered cultural tours. They spend more, travel more often, and stay longer. Simply put, independent music venues and the creative arts are economic engines for communities nationwide. Today, the roller coaster ride of the pandemic continues. Traditionally, about 5% of ticket buyers don't attend performances, but now sagging consumer confidence is causing national no-show rates as high as 50%. This is devastating because most of our venues rely on in-house sales to pay core bills. We are also now confronted with increased costs due to inflation. Just in the past month, I've received notices of impending price increases from our trash hauler to our concession suppliers to our janitorial service. And like many other businesses, we face the difficult challenge of finding workers in a competitive environment. Remote work is not an option for our business. It is especially challenging to compete with national employers who are able to offer higher starting wages. The passing of the Save Our Stages Act was a break we needed to survive the pandemic. Now in the face of increasingly difficult economic conditions, we're looking for the break we need in order to thrive. I have seen the ability of the creative economy to bring Americans to their feet out of pure joy amidst the darkness of the pandemic. I have seen the power of the creative economy to transform a two lane stretch of blacktop into a world famous tourism destination. Thank you for recognizing the importance of our industry and the value our small businesses add to communities across America. I urge you to keep the creative economy top of mind as you consider policies affecting small business. Thank you for your time and leadership. And thank you, Ms. Presley, and, and to all of our witnesses. Uh, we appreciate what you've shared with us and you've very much humanized um, an issue of great importance to all of us on this committee uh, and to our country. Uh, now I'd like to begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. And Mr. Elrod, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you've re referenced the pendulum of openings and closings and stops and starts uh, of so many uh, entertainment businesses. Uh, and as you know better than anyone, the live events industry in particular has been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So can you share a little bit more with all of us um, how our theater companies in particular are responding to the chaos and disruptions of new openings and cancellations due to Omicron in particular? Well, I think I can speak to my own experience in that, um, you know, the show that I was working on this fall, The Alchemist for the Red Bull Theater Company, mm -hmm. uh, was an off-Broadway show at the New World Stages in Midtown Manhattan. And after 15 months of uh, being completely and totally dark, finally Broadway was starting to come mm -hmm. back, off-Broadway was starting to come back. So here we were, it was a comedy, and despite the masks, things were starting to look up and come back to normal. But just a few weeks into our run, we started to see the impacts of Omicron all across the city as different shows had different people calling out. And we, especially on Broadway, where uh, shows are a little bit better resourced with understudies and covers and replacements for everybody in the building, even those most, most resourced shows were facing challenges that were ending up putting shows on hiatus or closing them all together. So we were kind of watching from the sideline. And then on December 15th, it came to us in the form of me coming to the theater with symptoms, taking a rapid test, seeing a positive result. And 
three other people in the cast got it. And without the understudies, without the extra stage hands, uh, the theater was faced with only one choice and that was to close the show completely. So it, it is very, very hard. As um, Rayanne Presley said, remote work is not an option. We all have to be there in the building. And if we're sick, we can't be in the building and you can see the consequences writ large all over the country, anywhere people have to gather together in enclosed spaces. I appreciate that. And also your advocacy for uh, more targeted relief dollars uh, for an industry grappling with um, the challenges and in particular uh, the actors and the artists uh, that are so impacted. So thank you. Uh, thank Ms. You, Garrett, I, I, you've noted that the Oregon uh, Shakespeare Festival received $10 million, I believe in, SBOG funds and also $5 million in PPP funds. Uh, could you share with the committee in more detail uh, on how those allocations you know, helped the organization survive? Yeah, if you can imagine um, at a $44 million organization, our spend rate was like $5 million a month. And even when we had to shrink everything down to about 10% of our, of our staff, we were still going through um, a lot of money um, giving back tickets and revenue and that kind of a thing and keeping our lights on and the doors open and all of that stuff. Um, that resource is supporting all kinds of things, including we were able to open a production last summer. We were able to do a production, um, uh, our first winter production uh, that, that opened and closed uh, without any COVID related uh, closures, thank, uh, thank God. But we're spending uh, $200,000 a month on tests um, just to try to keep you know, people aware of, of whether or not they're sick or not. Um, we have a, a very kind of uh, robust system around making sure that we do have a lot of people covering um, nice. because closing uh, for COVID was not an option for us to be able to open that show. Um, and every time um, we do spend uh, money at OSF to make sure that we keep going, we, we take the industry entire um, town with us. Everybody comes with us on that journey. So the restaurants are open because of the PPP money. The, the, um, the hotels are open because of the SVOG money. Um, so so in, in rural Oregon, we're, we're a, a complete ecology interconnected with, with one another. Um, and so for every dollar that we received from the federal government, every resource um, every single dime helped to make sure that we could buoy the entire region, especially through the fire. And, and now we have a little bit of a resource to be able to hopefully open um, this spring. Um, and we're all crossing our fingers, but this is with a lot of resource being spent in advance to get the shows open and a lot of resource being spent for testing. Right, well, I see, and I thank you. I see my time is expiring. So now I'd like to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Luchtmeyer for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I'll start out with a, a question from Ms. Presley here. Um, in your testimony, you talk uh, a, a little bit about, you know, the, the, the dealing with inflation, with uh, rising costs, uh, worker problems. Can you elaborate a little bit on that uh, from the standpoint of how you're able to absorb those costs, uh, how you're able to uh, keep going? I know you mentioned the uh, SBOG program as one of the ways to be helpful in PPP. So. Can you paint a, a, a fuller picture for me, please? I'm happy to, Congressman Lutemeyer. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. I would say that the uniqueness of a small business, which there are millions, of course, throughout our nation, uh, inflation is certainly going to impact um, in many ways as we look forward. While the PPP money and the Save Our Stages money was critical to keeping our employees um, on payroll this last year and to um, allow us to not borrow an enormous amount of money to keep open, uh, in uncertainty is the future. In terms of inflation, um, my really only two options are to pass costs along to our customers or to diminish mm -hmm. my customer experience. And while I'm getting notices from some vendors about their increases in price, I also know that um, I will simply open bills come May and June and find that um, uh, things cost more. Those are very real for all of our small business owners. And to remind you as a small business owner, we're, uh, we don't have a deep 
financial backstop, uh, we are it. And we each sign um, agreements with our banks and our lenders to put our homes on the line and our uh, assets on the line. We're happy to do that. We're happy to grow our businesses, but it's difficult. And with the uncertainty with COVID, uh, it's unknown. We need consumer confidence to rally. Uh, we need people to feel safe and want to travel and spend their money on entertainment when they have other um, needs as well. You know, there's a limit, you know, as a small business person, you know, you can price some of those increases into your higher ticket prices, but there's a price point in which the, your, your, your customer base is going to say, no, we can't afford this or no we're not going to do this or they're going to cut back on the number of shows they go see you know if you could elaborate and, and there in branson you have an enormous number of shows and, and not only uh venues but a number of shows per day and so a lot of people go there and they see multiple shows over two or three days they're going to cut down on those number of shows if they raise price points have you looked at that what what the price point would be and how much of an effect you know not only yourself but your other uh, venues there in Branson, how much they can, how much they an increase they can stand? Well, Branson's been built on very family friendly, affordable <laughs> entertainment. Uh, that is one of our hallmarks, and we're proud of that. There are 37 theaters right now that uh, host performances, and that price point is frankly unknown. Uh, we will pass along some of the cost increases to our customers and increase ticket prices this next year. Uh, I wish I could say that I that I knew, but I do know that human nature tells me that um, as we've seen at venues across the nation, people are going to not buy that extra T-shirt. They're maybe not going to have the merchandise that, to take home that they would have normally had. They may uh, not buy as much concession stands or food. And those are really vital things for our independent venues to help uh, with the bottom line. Uh, I, I am hopeful that our customers will stay with us and realize that they want a quality product. And so far, uh, we've seen that to be the case, but we are always uh, looking for ways to make a family vacation affordable. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Garrett, you made a comment that really uh, kind of stuck with me, and that is the ripple effect of the uh, SBOG program's dollars. Um, you know, you were saying that, you know, to keep your business, uh, business, uh, your, your entertainment venue going is not Im only important to the venue and the workers themselves, but to the rest of the businesses in the area. And so um, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on that? I think it's a very important point. Yeah, you know, we're, OSF, thank you very much for the question. And OSF is in a rural area. So um, we are a, a kind of interdependent ecology. Everything that we do affects everyone around us. Um, and so when I said that we laid off 500 people and 5,000 people lost their jobs locally, you can imagine the impact. This is a place that people move to with their families to, uh, to work at OSF and other businesses around here. And with our tourism um, at a standstill, it was you know, very difficult for people to keep their businesses open without OSF being open. Thank you for that. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, sir. And with that, I, I now recognize Ms. Davids from Kansas, the chair of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, and then for those who are uh, offering testimony today, uh, I appreciate your time uh, to talk about this important uh, important topic and as it relates to the importance of the creative arts sector uh, for our, our small business um, small business community you know I we're, we're hearing about it how hard the sector was hit um, and continues to be uh, by this pandemic and you know the artists and and creative arts small businesses have had to work really hard to overcome um, some of the unique and particular challenges um, that that are being faced. Uh, in, in Kansas, the arts sector makes up around 3% of our state's uh, GDP and employs about 50,000 Kansans. Um, I feel like I have, I do have to mention, I have spent some summers uh, going down to uh, Branson and Lake of the Ozarks too. So um, appreciate uh, seeing you on here today, Ms. Presley. Um, 
but because of the importance um, to uh, to Kansas, I was I was really proud to to be one of those folks to help create the Shuttered Venues Operators Grants Program. Um, you know, providing directed relief to theaters and music venues and and other performance venues. Um, Kansas small businesses received around ninety nine million dollars in in SVOG grants last year, which you know really provided a lifeline to hundreds of small businesses and. I've continued to advocate for additional directed relief funds for these kinds of businesses. And uh, as the most recent variant has shown us, we are, we're, we're not quite out of the uh, pandemic yet. So um, in conversations uh, with uh, local uh, organizations like nonprofits, like the Arts Council of Johnson County, uh, we know that they've been working to support creative partners throughout the community during the pandemic. And, and most recently, I started focusing on small business um, education and helping artists understand uh, some best practices, you know, business and legal practices. And so I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Karras, do, do you think that the artistic community could benefit um, kind of more broadly from from uh, programs like this, business counseling and guidance, especially for those um, small artist-led businesses? Well, the, certainly the business owners uh, can benefit from any kind of development that, uh, that can be offered to them in terms of education, uh, what's available out there for, um, for economic development, uh, certain trends that people often don't see when they're, you know, when they're running their own business, they might not see the trends that are going on around them. Uh, as to the ripple effect that, of course, it will have is on the individuals they hire, the workers. And so everybody will, will benefit from it to the extent that um, the education is out there. Um, you know, when, when government gets involved in looking at very carefully and assisting business, uh, we all benefit, uh, not just the people who own the businesses, but the people who work in them. And, and as I, I stated before, you know, the ancillary businesses that benefit from all of the arts economy uh, is all, sometimes immeasurable. Um, you know, we, we don't even sometimes stop and think about who might be creating a business around something uh, mm -hmm. just because there's an arts employer in the area. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the short answer is yes. I think I think business owners um, and business developers could benefit from all the education and development that uh, could be available to them. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Garrett, I was uh, hoping to hear from you about uh, you know we we heard you talk about the kind of ripples and those economic shocks. Um, that, that we see, and, and particularly as it relates to in-person programming, I'm curious about your view of how we can help the, uh, you know, small businesses in this sec sector stay resilient um, as we think about further pandemic um, and maybe other types of, uh, of disruptions. So locally, I think it's important to make sure that we that the federal government keeps um, in, infusing um, resource back into these these ecologies and communities. Um, for mine in particular, I think um, you know just like every other industry, we're going through this sort of great resignation. Um, the the more dollars that are um, that are lost within the in these industries that are interconnected, the uh, more likely people are to leave to go to other industries that are they're more likely to be able to survive. And creative workers in particular are leaving in droves, um, and so they're leaving restaurants and they're leaving theaters and they're leaving you know they're leaving their day job, they're leaving everything so that they can uh, figure out a way to survive. So more infusion of resource would really be helpful. I thank you for the question. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. And now I recognize the vice ranking member of the committee, Mr. Williams of Texas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all of our witnesses. Uh, I'm uh, like all of you. I'm a small business owner in uh, Texas. I have been for 51 years. Uh, and my father was a great singer in the stage of the round at the Casa Mignon in Fort Worth, Texas. So I grew up seeing a lot of your industry. Uh, when I talk to uh, business owners back in Texas, uh, they're concerned about uh, uh, our supply chains, their out of control inflation, and the constant threat of tax increases coming from the Democrats in Washington. 
Each one of these crises poses new challenges for small business and adds additional costs for them to keep their lights on. This leaves business owners with tough decisions in order to keep uh, doing what they love. Uh, they may have uh, to reduce capital investment. They may have to hold off on hiring new employees or pass the costs if they can along to consumers and raise prices as they are able to keep their doors open. So Ms. Presley, a uh, question to you is your in your testimony, you talked about how your business has struggled with the increase in cost of goods due to inflation. We all have that problem. Can you discuss the adjustments your business will have to make to offset these cost increases? And furthermore, how do you think tax increases proposed by the Democrats would afford or could affect your business? Well, thank you, Congressman Williams. And thank you as well for your sponsorship of the Save Our Stages mm -hmm. Act. Um, we're, uh, as I said, we'll open again in March. And, and I think some of the difficult decisions we will make, uh, this is the time of year when we order the sequin jackets and costume and when we make upgrades to our stage, uh, when we look at hiring new performers. Those are all decisions that I believe we will make a bit on a hope and a prayer, to be honest. Um, we're very much focused on um, uh, what's in front of us, not so much the unknown. Uh, we feel like with COVID and all of the issues that uh, you and, and uh, Congress must, must have on your plates, we respect that. Uh, one thing that would be helpful I wanted to mention um, while I had the opportunity is, as you know, with the SBA, we all received, um, many of us received, uh, grants that helped our businesses. Uh, those grants were a bit late in coming and we're hoping very much for an extension of time to spend that money. That could make a big difference for many of our venues. And so I wanted to put that uh, before you as well. Uh, we are hopeful that COVID will um, abate. We see that happening in the East, but not here yet. And we are very much hoping to uh, be able to operate our businesses as we've done, as we've done in the past. Um, and keep our costs uh, in line so that folks can have a great time. Okay. Uh, I was the Republican lead, as many of you said today, and I appreciate that on the Save Our Stages bill that ultimately turned the Shuttered Venues Operation Grant Program, better known as SBOG. Uh, this was a necessary piece of legislation because it helped businesses that were some of the first to close uh, and the last to open as a result of the pandemic. Unfortunately, the SBA took months to get this program up and running and many venues did not survive these delays. And I applaud businesses like yours, Ms. Presley, for being so resilient and able to hold off on through this incompetency we saw the SBA in order to access these funds. Now, throughout this process, I worked extensively with NEVA uh, to communicate the horror stories that we're uh, hearing from the industry as businesses failed to get answers from the SBA regarding the program. So another question to you, Ms. Presley, can you expand on your experience with the SBA and any issues you face when attempting to receive the SBOG funds? Well, we had not worked with the SBA in, in, in the past. Um, you know, Presley, so I was thinking about all the things that we've gone through in 56 years. We've been through 9-11 and gas shortages and recessions. So uh, this one's a new one. Uh, but what, what our experience with the SBA was good. Um, we did have that delay and that was um, uh, certainly made everyone tense and nervous. Many people want to grow their businesses. Entrepreneurs want to start new businesses. Uh, we're, we're seldom happy with the status quo. And I believe SBA could be a backstop for us, could provide a lot of information and knowledge that an entrepreneur might not have. So I will say that um, uh, I look forward to kind of renewed efforts well, easier, not harder, would be what we want the SBA to understand. Uh, lastly, business uh, across the country is struggling to find and retain talented workers. Hey, Mr. Sector, Williams, your, your time has expired, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. My time has expired. I return to you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, and with that, I recognize the gentle lady from Illinois, Ms. Newman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member, for putting together this um, great testimony today. So let me start by thanking all of the, the witnesses on this call today for you've brought light and love to when we desperately needed it throughout um, our nation. Um, I'm a firm believer that um, the arts uh, not only heal and help us get through hard times, but also unite um, those that typically are not united. Um, so thank you for your great work. I will also say a couple of other things. Um, having 
been an assistant producer and a copywriter in my early career, I have very genuine uh, feelings on this topic uh, because those were hard times when I had no health care. I went uh, without jobs for long periods of time. Um, and it was just a constant struggle. So um, I, I clearly have the lived experience around it, but also you're living it right now in a much uh, more challenging environment. So I that much more applaud your amazing work. Um, I'm also a former small business owner, so uh, kind of a 360 on this topic. So I, I feel for everyone. I have um, a, a forward looking uh, set of questions and I'm gonna go to uh, Ms. Kara's first. Um, so being uh, a member of the, the uh, Labor Caucus, Women of Labor Caucus, and being uh, a product of unions and being a strong um, advocate for unions, um, there are just some really creative things that unions have done over time to support their workers in these times. We may have this issue again. I don't think we can deny that now. Um, so Ms. Karras, what do you think um, we can do to support our unions to help our um, artists and creative community to be um, stronger? Are there some ideas you have in a forward looking way um, that would help us anticipate um, further bad times at some point? Thank you, I, I appreciate this question. Um, I've been in unions for a long, long many years and uh, and I, uh, you know, every time I think about what unions do for the workers, it all comes down to providing the security of a group that supports itself and supports one another. You know, we call each other sisters and brothers in, in our organizations, and there is a kind of a family feeling. We depend on one another. You know, my, my colleague, Mr. Elrod and I are in the same unions and, and he knows he can depend on me and I know I can depend on him when the going gets rough. That's what solidarity is all about. So that's part of what unions provide for people. But moreover, the, um, the job security while they're working to know that they're going to be taken care of and employers, you know, it's, it's uh, no accident that the biggest entertainment employers in this country and maybe in the world hire multiple numbers of unions to do every project they have. Why is that? Because they know what they're getting. And that's another kind of security that we all look at. We wanna make sure that when we show up on the job, we're gonna be uh, treated decently. We get uh, good, uh, pension, health, and other job uh, securities. And we also know that our employers appreciate that we are ready to show up and provide professional work in a disciplined manner. And um, looking forward, I think that <clears throat> some, of the, um, some of the government, the COVID uh, pandemic relief that our union received along with hundreds of thousands of other businesses was a lifeline to keep the doors open, to keep the lights on, and some semblance of staff, even if you couldn't keep everyone, to provide securities for the industry, to, um, we, we provided assistance to members um, who couldn't pay rent, utilities, medical expenses, by donating to the Actors Fund, which is a charity, a national charity. Um, Union workplaces also know that <clears throat> they provide better conditions for women and people of color than non-union um, employers do. And um, the wages are higher, the benefits are better. And so when workers are looking for work, many of them want to go to unions because they know that they'll have that security. And we're seeing that kind of interest arise uh, among young people today throughout the country because they know if they band together, and tell their employer what they need, they're stronger together. So, you know, off the top of my head, those are, those are just some of the, the um, remarkable benefits of a union. And going forward, I think that if, as the stronger the union movement is, the more the workers will be there for the American economy. Well, thank you for your um, comments. And yes, well heard. Um, I obviously, um, as, as some of the folks mentioned, I'm a strong proponent of PACPA mm -hmm. and the PRO Act um, because when we have a, a stronger, uh, when we have stronger unions, we have a stronger middle class. Um, so thank you. Um, if I may, uh, 
Uh, the gentle lady's time has expired. Um, okay, thank you. And, I yield back. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, now, uh, Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald, the gentleman from Wisconsin, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Cross, there's been um, some interest from some arts and, and culture organizations, uh, including in my home state of Wisconsin, of temporarily removing the $300 cap on charitable giving deductions to allow, uh, I get more money to kind of flow uh, into the uh, nonprofit creative sector. Uh, which, which seems like, uh, you know, obviously a, an easy thing to do and a good thing to do. Um, but uh, you're here not only representing the Actors Equity Association, but also their foundation. It, have you guys looked at this and do you know what the impact might be? Uh, it, uh, you know, this would be, I guess, considered support for the uh, Performing Artist Tax Parity Act. Yes, thank you very much, Congressman. Um, I, you know, of course we, <clears throat> of course we've looked at it. All the tax changes that have that have come about uh, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and um, the recent adjustments that have been made to the code, and the above the line <clears throat> deduction for charitable contributions has certainly been a boon to the charities, who many of which uh, thought that they and and did actually lose contributions because of the the uh, less use of these of the itemized deduction schedule, um, the reduced use, I should say. Um, so yes, I think uh, I think any contributions to nonprofits are always going to be welcomed. Um, is it going to have a huge uh, effect on someone's tax liability? Possibly not uh, at at the rate of three hundred. But if it was unlimited, you would see the nonprofit uh, world. Uh, be much more uh, supported by the contributors because they would have an incentive to do it now if they're not using the itemized deduction schedule. So it's a it's a definite yes. Uh, we certainly approve of it. Um, and uh, while it doesn't have a direct effect on the uh, Performing Artists Tax Parity Act, that too will will support uh, businesses and employers as workers are able to stay in the industry, feel confident in the industry because they have equalized their, um, their incomes with other taxpayers who earn the same amount of money. Very good, thank, thank you for that answer. Uh, let me turn to uh, Ms. Garrett. Uh, Ms. Garrett, uh, kind of a trickier question, something that uh, obviously many entities are dealing with, but I know the Oregon uh, Shakespeare Festival announced that proof of full vaccination or a uh, negative COVID test will be required to attend performances in 2022. Um, we're kind of already seeing the effects of this requirement, um, but how much of an impact do you believe uh, this will have on ticket and concession sales? And, uh, you know, particularly, I, I guess, as we get closer, closer to spring, until and, and into the summer months. So thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, OSF has um, for years had a very loyal patron base um, that comes back year over year over year over year. And they love the company. They love the artists that work here and would do anything to make sure that those artists are safe. So what we have experienced in these last few months of, of producing plays is um, a real uh, robust participation in making sure that you know you're vaccinated and you have your card and um, that you have your proof of the test and you know that your child has a proof of the test and everybody's willing to go in and masks. We were kind of um, surprised at how compliant our our patron base is. Um, and again, that's because you know we have families, we have legacy families that have been coming here for thirty years. 40 years, um, grandparents bringing grandchildren. And, and so there is a, a real desire to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, so it will not affect our bottom line, I don't believe, because of the, the desire for people to be safe. And we've had patrons say, as they're standing in line with their 
cards and everything, you know, thank you for doing it this way. We really, we wanna be able to be safe too as we walk into these spaces. Yeah, I think the sands are, are shifting quickly on those issues and, and I think uh, we'll see how that plays out, but thank you for being here today and I yield back, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back and now uh, Ms. Bordeaux from Georgia is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, the cre creative economy is a very vital part of our nation's economy and uh, enriches our communities uh, through all sorts of cultural contributions. I know after being deprived during COVID for a while, just sitting and hearing people sing in person uh, just was such a wonderful spiritual uh, lifting up. Um, so I personally experienced what it's, how great it is to get back to the arts. Uh, in my district, arts-related businesses employ an estimated 10,000 people, and venues uh, in Georgia's 7th District receive some of the much-needed relief uh, in the form of over $2 million through the Shuttered Venue Operations Grant Program. But clearly, more work needs to be done. Um, the SVOG provided this important boost, uh, but one of the things we are starting to think about more now is what are we going to do if the COVID variants, if we keep getting hit by these COVID variants over and over and over again going forward? And how do we need to be thinking about how we support the arts industry? How do we uh, support industries like this over time if that is going to be the scenario? So I guess starting with Mr. Elrod, maybe if you could talk a little about this and sort of what is going on in the industry as they're thinking about this, obviously, Theater is about being in person, and that is that is challenging. Um, you know, what do you think the creative industry is going to need, uh, both to recover from the pandemic, but also to really prepare for the long term if this does, in fact, become something where we're going to have to deal with it for another couple of years? Well, thank you very much for the question. I, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is that with COVID-19, especially with Omicron, we're in a situation where we've been hit by a tsunami. The tidal wave is in and it has not gone out. So we don't actually know the negative impact on the entire creative economy right now. And, you know, one of the closest things we had is that Brookings Institute report, Institution's report from last summer, Lost Art COVID-19's devastating impact on the creative economy, which measure, measured losses just between April and June of 2020. And we were talking about $150 billion in lost sales and 2.7 million unemployed arts workers. So if you extrapolate that out and just keep multiplying over and over and over again, you really do think about it in terms of that star analogy that I used in my opening speech. We are in a situation where there are possibly, probably many black holes all over the country with lost art, lost institutions, closed venues, and um, arts workers themselves. Uh, Ms. Garrett talked about the workforce leaving and doing other things. And when you think about who we are, what we do, and what we provide, you want these 5.2 million workers doing what we do. You want all 673,000 businesses to survive this because they do anchor local dynamic economies. So what there is to do about it is absolutely all of the interventions that everybody else has been talking about. But what I was proposing in my opening testimony is a kind of creative economy super package. If you take every piece of uh, arts investment legislation that's been introduced in the last couple of years, you know, put them together, uh, really make sure there's robust unemployment. Um, you can put together um, basically a floor underneath the entire industry, especially our arts workers, and get us to launch into this next phase. But because there is so much unknown and the wave is still in, that's why I was recommending maybe a GAO report or a congressional commission, because I, I think with a $919 billion industry that suffered this much damage and continues to suffer this much damage, we have to take a really deep granular look at what is happening, what has happened, and what needs to happen for us to come back. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna run out of time, but I just, I, I wanna just wrap up with this idea 
Um, so for instance, we've introduced legislation it's called the Fresh Air Act for Business, which is to improve ventilation uh, in businesses. And the idea is to approach it with, we need to restructure for the long haul, as opposed to just give short you know, shots of funding in order to just make it through the crisis. And so just wanna encourage everybody um, to start thinking about this. Uh, you know, we don't know for sure that that's what's gonna end up happening, but I think we need to start planning for that and start thinking about what is the congressional response if in fact this is gonna be something that we need to plan for the long haul. Thank you so much, I, I yield back. The gentle lady yields back and now the gentle lady from Texas, Ms. Van Dyne is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairwoman and Ranking Member Lokemeyer for holding this hearing. Um, early in the pandemic, the effect on the creative economy was apparent. Shows were halted, venues were shuttered. Uh, due to unclear CDC guidance, state and local restrictions were constantly shifting, making it very hard for small businesses to reopen and stay open. Um, after a long wait, consumers in many states, such as Texas, um, where I represent, are now returning to their pre-pandemic lives. There's no doubt that one of the keys to a thriving creative economy is an open society. On states and localities across the country should follow Texas's model. Unfortunately, those eager to return are now faced with new economic challenges. Everywhere you turn, from the gas pump to the grocery store, prices are rising uh, the fastest in four decades, and that's if you can even avoid empty shelves. Um, the Democrats' response continues to be throwing more money at the problem, but at what point do we ask what we're getting for that money? We spent taxpayer dollars paying people to stay home from work, uh, for much of the pandemic, still hurting employers. And just last week, we had the SBA's OIG unable to tell us what happens to the billions of dollars of fraudulent money that are claw it's clawed back from SBA's COVID relief programs, money that could be highly beneficial to the very businesses that we're discussing today. The creative sector is part of the small business economy and all small businesses are in desperate need of solutions to inflation, supply chain struggles and employment shortages. What we don't need is another frivolous multi-trillion dollar spending package while we're chasing down at least $100 billion in fraud. The fact is billions of federal dollars remain unspent and state governments have so much excess of stimulus money that they're now paying off deficits that were created by their failure to keep a balanced budget instead of going toward the pandemic. I'm interested, Mr. Elrod, you, um, you work, your, uh, your business is in New York City. Um, during the pandemic, state and local governments diverged in how they handled restrictions in their respective communities. In each of your communities, well, specifically in New York, how did your state and local restrictions and regulations affect your business and ability to operate? Well, in New York City, um, I, I was uh, sitting with a friend of mine. Uh, I was on my way to see a Broadway show on March 11th, and we were sitting in a midtown uh, bar and our governor came on and announced that Broadway was closing and uh, not far after that off Broadway. And then pretty much the curtain came down and the lights went out all across uh, New York City. Yeah. And a, a lot of people uh, in retrospect feel that March 11th was too late and that the response was too slow and that the virus had already taken hold in New York City, obviously a very dense metropolitan area. Um, as an L train rider, I can tell you we were all yeah. in a lot of danger. Um, and so I, I, I believe that what happened was uh, appropriate and a prophylactic against. So, you, so um, then you're agreeing that shutting down was the appropriate response. That, and I also need to ask, do you understand that New York City uh, or New York uh, has received over $272 billion in COVID relief? I'm wondering how much of that $272 billion um, has been received by the state of New York. Do you do you feel like that was appropriately spent on on the arts? Well, what I part of uh, efforts I was with earlier in the year 
as BNR Tira, we were deciding, do we go to um, the state and see if we can get American rescue plans or do we continue talking to the federal government? And the answer has to be both because what we're, yes. what we're really doing here with BNR Tiro is we're calling it KELP, the Creative Economy Literacy Project. And what we're trying to do is talk to people like you and in state and local government and say, hey, we are in a profound amount of trouble. And if you really want to build back in an incredible way, we're the way to do it. But you need to stabilize us put a floor underneath us, and then you can harness us as a backbone of a great recovery. So in my opinion, um, there's never going to be enough money spent on the creative economy until uh, everybody understands just what a uh, phenomenon we are and what an incredible resource is available uh, to policymakers if they would like to take advantage of us. And that's, that's why I've proposed this kind of super package to stabilize us and allow us to you know, help us to help you build back on the other side of this. After the plague came the Renaissance, after the 1918 flu came the roaring 20s, there's gonna be a huge appetite for what we have to offer. So we need to be around to offer it and we Thank will jumpstart us. My, my, my time is done, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentle lady's time has expired. And now um, I recognize myself for five minutes. First, I want to thank Chairwoman Velasquez for calling this important hearing, which I was truly looking forward to as a representative of the Los Angeles area, which is the center of film, television, and music. Um, it's hard to overstate the impact that the pandemic has had on the creative economy. To support a strong, durable recovery for those industries that employ over 5 million workers nationwide, we need to ensure that creative professionals are fairly compensated for their work. And that includes musical artists like members of the Recording Academy who must be fairly compensated as well as our actors of film and television. That's why I am proud to have founded and relaunched the Bipartisan Creative Rights Caucus with my co-chair representative Drew Ferguson of Georgia. This caucus will continue to work to protect the rights of content creators, and I look forward to working with you to further this goal. I also ask for unanimous consent to submit for the record testimony from the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of TV and Radio Artists, or SAG-AFTRA, which represents 160,000 hardworking professionals in the entertainment industry. And as chair, I say, so ordered. So. Now for my question, uh, Ms. Karras and Mr. Elrod, I'm proud to have introduced HR 4750, the Performing Artist Tax Parity Act of 2021. This legislation would modernize the qualified performing artist tax deduction to ensure that more creative workers can seek employment without facing steep personal expenses. Now, I'm proud to have pushed for relief for uh, performers, for instance, for the gig worker pandemic unemployment benefit and for the mixed income unemployment subsidy, which were successfully included in our um, legislation to relieve uh, us on, on the pandemic. And I'm also proud that this committee uh, supported theaters and venues through the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. But we must do so much more to support the actors, musicians, and artists who make performances so incredibly special. The Qualified Performing Artists Tax Deduction has not been updated in decades and currently does not meet the needs of performers. So Ms. Karras, can you talk more about the purpose of this tax deduction and why we need legislation to modernize it for today's economy? And Mr. Elrod, I've heard from so many performers who have to pay for extra expenses like photo and makeup and still not get the job necessarily. Uh, can you tell us your stories about the expenses that performers have to face? Ms. Karras? Thank you very much, Congresswoman Chu. Um, and you know, we also thank you for your introduction of this bill. Um, H.R. 4750 uh, and the support that, that we've gotten so far. Uh, PATPA is a correction to an un, uh, 
you know, an unintended consequence um, of what happens when a bill is created by a president, uh, in this case, Ronald Reagan, recognizing the value of entertainment workers in the code. And the provision itself wasn't indexed for inflation. Uh, Congress saw fit to leave it in the code with the last uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, tax bill. And we were grateful for that, but we realized that the modernization is long, long overdue. What this bill does is it levels the playing field uh, by equalizing the income that people who work in the performing arts have against people who don't work in the performing arts. I'll just give you a little example. Uh, you and I are both single and I'm a, in the performing arts and you work in an office and we both earn $80,000, but I'm spending about 25% of my gross income to pay my agent, my manager, to look for work, transportation, continuing education and classes, some equipment, and especially during the pandemic, we've all had uh, to buy recording. Ms. Karras, uh, I'd like to give time for Mr. Elrod also to say something. Oh, thank right. you very much. Thank you very much. I would I would simply join Miss Karras in everything that we, she was saying. And just on a personal anecdotal note, of course, the challenges of the pandemic have increased personal costs. Even while we suffer 15 months and more of total unemployment, we are expected to have the highest quality uh, internet, the highest quality computers and cameras and microphones. And for the little work that we are able to do during this time, we're still paying you know, 10% agent commissions. So there are lots and lots of out-of-pocket expenses that uh, performing artists have to take on. Is, and they have actually increased during one of the hardest moments for us. And so something uh, like the passage of, of the bill that you've introduced would help us out a lot. And thank you for introducing it. Thank you so much. My time has expired. And now, uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, uh, Mr. Meiser, is uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I thank our ranking member very much, uh, Lukamai, for bringing us all together. Very interesting subject. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, for all being here. So um, I wanna just talk a little bit initially <clears throat> about the, the general business concerns that your industry has and in, in, in you as proprietors and entrepreneurs and, and uh, stakeholders, you know, obviously education uh, to, to create your, your, your best workers, your staff, your talent. Um, education these days is unbelievably high, both, both um, uh, very expensive, both public and private. So the skills development, it must be a challenge. Taxes, certainly in New York and other cities are, are crazy. Um, any idea of increased uh, increased tax on small businesses uh, doesn't, in, in my view, help uh, at all. Um, uh, in, in keeping your employees happy, healthy, uh, but as well safe, you know, because I want to want to ask about that a little bit. How public safety, uh, maybe uh, it, it, where that weighs in here, access to capital, very important. Your cash flow, you've all been you've all been talking about that. Um, uh, technology, I, I made a note of, but that's something a little bit different. Capital investment, it was mentioned about the ventilators just came up briefly. Um, what sort of additional capital investments were made to handle COVID and and um, just matters moving forward? I think people are just generally more, probably more, more, more health conscious, um, you know, and uh, your, your, your product, of course, uh, creating that uh, and your customers. Uh, now, I understand, see, you folks um, were shut down or, or Broadway, I'm, I'm, I'm relating this somewhat to Broadway, I can't speak for Branson, shut down for about 18 months, I believe. Um, now, Japan was shut down for six months, UK was shut down for 12. And yet, even with, with that buildup, uh, your level of customer or um, you're, you're getting about 60, uh, 60%, 66% of capacity now. So, and, and, and Japan was very big on the whole ventilator uh, plan, um, UK to an extent, they, they were trying to catch up afterwards. I'm not so sure what was being done uh, on, on uh, Broadway and Branson and, and LA and other places, 
But, you know, the thing is this. I mean, look, we I, probably everybody on here has seen The Phantom, seen Hamilton, seen, you know, Wicked, and Jersey Boys and love the theater. So we're very much advocates and proponents of doing what it takes to help bring this extremely important um, uh, industry back. I mean, I have a daughter that live, lives in lives in Manhattan and, and all that's very important. So the, um, the thing is, uh, I want to ask, what would you like to see? What besides additional PPP and it, or even if that's necessary, or the, the, the shutter venue uh, program, what would you do differently? I mean, Monday morning quarterback is easy. What would you do? What are we going to do? What is your plan moving forward? What, where can we be of assistance? Because it's also notable that, for instance, the NHL, indoor, larger arena, understand, but they, they, they've had a record year. And yet, you know, our entertainment industry uh, is, is struggling big time. So I'll ask uh, Ms. Presley. I know you're Branson, Branson and Mr. Elrod. I'd like to ask you, what, 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 have we, what have we learned and what should we do moving forward that would be favorable to, to you all and to your business? Well, thank you, Congressman. I appreciate the question. It's a difficult choice. There's no way around that. Um, I think consumer confidence is really where we're focused as an association with NEVA. Uh, as we talked about, uh, my business is uh, here. We're, we are looking out for our guests and our, our customers and our employees. We're encouraging mass and we're encouraging vaccination, but that is um, where we are here in Missouri. Uh, for other venues across the nation, there are multiple, multiple um, rather different um, views of this. And of course, going forward with COVID, it's very hard to know. Uh, and, and Ms. Presley, I'm sorry, I, I probably had too long of an opening. Mr. Elrod, could you speak upon uh, in New York? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the short answer is, wouldn't it be great to have a Secretary of Arts and Culture? You know, when we have agriculture and it is in trouble, there is a Secretary of Agriculture to say, okay, this is what needs to be done. Let, let's take a deep dive analysis. If we had a Secretary of the creative, uh, creative Economy or Arts and Culture, somebody at the executive level on the Domestic Policy Council who could say, all right, look at this $919 billion industry and this $5.2 million, uh, 5.2 million person workforce. Look at the jeopardy therein. Let's develop together the guidance of what to do. Right off the top of my head, obviously continuing a, a robust unemployment uh, thing for, for the nation's arts workers would be fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Elrod. I'm, I'm yeah. running out of time. I will make oh, that recommendation to our governor of Pennsylvania, and I do believe in the film tax credit So and your industry. So thank you very much. I'm the sorry, gentleman's Madam Chair, time has expired. Yeah, the gentleman's time has expired. And now uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Kim, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'd like to start, Madam Chair, by just asking unanimous consent to enter a letter from our pride, New Jersey, into the record. So ordered. Great. Thank you. Uh, our pride, New Jersey, uh, is based in Burlington and it's in my district. And pre-COVID, there were over 19,000 arts-related businesses in New Jersey that employ more than 80,000 people. In our state, every art and cultural patron spends over $33 in local economies each time they purchase a ticket for a cultural event. And that translates into over $662 million each year in economic impact when cultural venues are fully up in operation. So the creative sector clearly is having a real impact in terms of creating jobs and economic activity. But I also want to focus on another element here, which is that it has an impact on our kids. And they've been through an awful lot over the last couple of years. Back in April, I met with uh, the Burlington County Regional Chamber of Commerce, and they connected me with an organization called the Morristown Theater Company in my district. As a nonprofit arts organization without their own building, they weren't sure if they were eligible for the shuttered venues operators grant. Uh, they had to get extra creative uh, during the pandemic and even pr producing shows out of a parking lot. My office was able to work with them to confirm that they were eligible, encourage them to apply. They ended up getting $200,000 grant. 
They also utilize the EIDL, the PPP, employee retention credits and assistance from the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. They report that this grant along with others allowed them to keep their doors open and to keep their work going forward. Just yesterday I checked in and they were starting rehearsal for an upcoming production of The Little Mermaid, which they're working on with a lot of little kids in the community. And the kids are incredibly excited that we're doing this hearing today and shining a light on the arts and about how it impacts them. I want these kids and kids all over the country to, to know that, that we're listening to them and that we understand that this is not just about business, it's about our development and it's about our education to our kids as well. So I just wanted to throw this out there. I mean, you know, Ms. Garrett, I know your organization works with professional artists, but if you or any of the other witnesses would like to speak to the importance of the arts for our children, what they have missed during this pandemic, and the benefit of investing in the arts, experiencing the arts education for our children and our families, and what it is that we can try to do to just try to make up for this lost time in terms of you know, being able to give our kids that opportunity to experience arts, but also to be able to participate in it. So uh, I just kind of wanted to open up if anyone wanted, Ms. Garrett, if you wanted to start off. I thank you for the question. You know, numerous studies have shown repeatedly that arts education increases student engagement, helps them learn positive habits and attitudes and creativity and creative problem solving and teaches critical intellectual skills and observation and helps them learn languages and mathematics and helps them practice teamwork and, and all of that. OSF has been a leader in arts education for more than 50 years. And like I said, during my opening statement, you know, we have 2,300 um, education and engagement programs that were completely shut down um, that served communities across the region. Um, we have students that come in from all over um, the West Coast to uh, watch our plays, to learn something from our artists, um, to engage in activities around creative art making. And the loss of that is twofold. The first is that you lose access to all of those wonderful things that we all get when we all benefit from when we when we um, learn in arts education programs, but you also lose that that pipeline. You know, I started in arts ed education programming. Um, most of us who are arts workers um, did. We started there. We learned about a craft, and we continued to to focus on it um, until we mastered it. And so, without introducing children, um, you, you don't, you don't at the other end, you don't have enough people on the other end who are really interested and engaged. And here's the thing is like most of us in, in, in the arts uh, creative economy, we have transmutable skills. We can, you know, some of yeah. us uh, carpenters can work in construction. Um, you know, um, I, I run a, a multi-million dollar multilateral business. I could run a, I could be a CEO of a different kind of company. Um, you know, you have to sort of think about it like that, that we, we give our skill set um, to this industry so that everybody can yeah. benefit from it. I think what you raised there about the pipeline, you know, what you raised there about the pipeline is great. And the last thing I'll just say, and I'll close is that, you know, I also felt like with my own kids, I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old that, you know, getting them to engage back in arts has been a way to kind of socialize them back into the society after, you know, especially half, half my, half my four-year-old's life has been in a pandemic. And getting him to go and sing and, and dance and other things like that has been so rewarding. So thank you for what you do. And uh, Madam Chair, I, I turn it back to you. The gentleman's time has expired. And now the gentle lady from California, Ms. Kim is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman and Ranking Member Lukemeyer for holding this hearing. I wanna thank all our panelists for your time and uh, engaging in our conversation with us. You know, first, Ms. Presley, uh, in your testimony, you indicated that your business is struggling with the increased cost of uh, goods because of the inflation. So can you look at your list of expenses and tell me which are the biggest price increases that you have noticed in the last six months? And as you know, I say this because these price increases, the inflation, it's going, it's expected to persist until well into middle of next year. So I wanted to hear your thoughts and uh, elaborate how this is going to affect your business and your planning. Well, I wish I could say exactly, thank you, Congresswoman first. 
Um, I wish I could say that I exactly know we are, we are dark right now and we will open again in March, but I certainly see increases coming and shortages as well of the type of merchandise that we sell. I see that in terms of our concession supplies. Um, we saw that last fall, um, not only just price increases, but we saw inability to um, secure cups and different things that we need for our business. We know that's real. Um, it's unknown yet in terms of insurance costs, but we anticipate that that may happen as well. Uh, it's, it's not any one thing I would say, it's just cumulative. And, uh, and when you run a small business like our independent venues do, it's the cumulative things that actually um, are most difficult to, uh, to manage. Sure. Well, thanks for your answer, because I asked that because if the businesses have to plan and deal with inflation well into next year and beyond, it's clear that the problem is not transitory and we have to deal with it, right? So I just wanted to ask that. But I also want to um, ask a question to you, Ms. Uh, Presley. Uh, I was intrigued by the statistic that you quote uh, that for every dollar spent at a small music venue, $12 of economic activity was generated for area businesses. Can you elaborate on that study and share with us your unique experience with the local economic ripple effect of Presley's Theater in Branson? Well, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I mean that, I, I suspect if you think back about the last time you took a vacation, um, you very seldom go to do one thing and uh, then leave. So we are uh, cognizant that when our visitors come to Branson, uh, it's usually a visitor party of about three and a half people and they spend over $1,100 uh, inside our community uh, to do things. They buy gas, they eat at the local restaurant, they for certain go shopping, uh, they are likely to uh, uh, you know, see more things. People tend to see over three shows when they come to Branson, Missouri. So uh, I see this um, with all of our independent venues and small businesses, whether you be rural or um, uh, urban. Uh, you, you go downtown Chicago, you're, you're going to see something fun at a music venue, but you're going to uh, stop before and after. Maybe you're going to have a drink. You took a Uber to get to your destination. I, I think that it is easy to see how we um, are able to multiply the $1 uh, into economic uh, numbers that enhance our entire community, keeps people employed. Thank you for your answer. You know, uh, like uh, Ms. Judy Chu, I represent the state of California with, where we have Hollywood and, you know, movies and entertainment is really the, the key, uh, one of the key industries in our state. And uh, we welcome everybody and we can really expand on that dollar span and generate that economic activity that we uh, talked about in Missouri. Uh, next question I would like to ask is to uh, Ms. Garrett. Uh, an ongoing theme that we've explored in this committee is the supply chain crisis. Uh, businesses, especially the small businesses, are unable to source goods necessary to create their products or deliver goods to anxious customers because of the supply chain crisis. And I realize that your business is a live entertainment and is, is not a good space business, but have you seen any impact in this regard? in the live entertainment uh, realm? Oh, yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, so because of the surge in con consumer demand and COVID warehouse closures, we had a whole myriad of issues um, trying to open up our shows last year. And we know we're gonna move into the same problems um, this year. Uh, cardboard, lumber, containers, trucks, workers, paint. We, um, we, um, canceled early performances because of supply chain issues for our winter show. Um, and, and people went on stage with paint still being wet. You know, the, the, there wasn't, the lumber didn't arrive on time. It was still sitting, you know, out on the water. The molding company um, had, had, a, had a COVID issue. So they weren't able to get things through the supply chain. And this is going to be ongoing. And after nearly two years of expenses with no audience revenues, the, the performing arts will find themselves facing outsized restart, restart costs. Um, that in, okay, the, gentle ladies, mm -hmm. the gentle lady's time has expired 
And now the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Miss um, <clears throat> Careless, I hope I get your name right. Um, you submitted testimony to the House Ways and Means Committee regarding your views on a qualified performance arts uh, tax deduction, portion of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Would you mind uh, elaborating on the effect of this tax increase has had on the working of working and middle class artists? I appreciate your question, Mr. Congressman. Uh, the very short answer is it's been discouraging. A lot of our uh, performing arts colleagues have decided to leave the business because they can no longer sustain the out-of-pocket costs to, to remain viable. Um, so they've taken other jobs, they've gone into other work, and, um, and it's been unfortunate that they've had to leave the industry. Those who have stayed have struggled uh, because as I was saying before, you know, to have to spend your out-of-pocket uh, money uh, off right off of your gross income and then be taxed equally the way someone else with the same wages you have is, you're starting, you know, behind um, already. So if, you know, if you have, uh, for example, if I spend 25% of my gross income on my um, out-of-pocket show business expenses just to stay viable and another taxpayer with the same wages doesn't have to, we're taxed the same, but I have fewer dollars to spend on my home, my rent, my utilities, my medical care. If I have a family on um, any of those costs, it's very discouraging. So we, uh, we are hoping that the uh, Performing Artist Tax Parity Act will get passed with all due speed to put us on a level playing field with taxpayers who have the same income, but don't have to, to spend the same amount of money to stay in their jobs. Uh, this is vital. And you know the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, really stressed tax relief for working and middle-class taxpayers. So this is all we're asking is to be on a level playing field to pay our fair share of tax, no more, but certainly uh, no less. I'd like to ask you a follow-up question. One of our largest exports is entertainment. Can you talk about how uh, important it is both for America and for the rest of the world that we, that we support creative economy for this reason? Thank you, yes, that's, uh, it, it is rather astounding the export of entertainment around the world. You know, we, those of us who are in the United States take it for granted that we can just have all of this content at any, at, at our fingertips. Um, a lot of it's recorded, much of it's live. Some of the live has been streamed over the pandemic. And, but when you think of the amount, the billions and billions of dollars that is sold internationally, it's astounding. Um, you know, section code section 181 to help the employers, um, the uh, production costs, the, the tax uh, subsidies, um, you know, we would, we would hope that the cap would be raised on that at some point to help those employers because the more help they have, the more production they generate. Um, the, um, uh, there is, well, as I said before, it's, you know, 4.3% of the GDP uh, is, is the entertainment sector. That's astounding. Most people don't even think about it because it's ephemeral. There's no durable goods there. So, um, you know, we, we are, are thankful for the support and we hope for all of it from this committee as well for the PATPA uh, so that we can enjoy the same level of spending if our tax burdens are equalized with those who don't have the burdens that we do. Real quickly, I'd like to follow up with Mr. Elroy on that same question 
and his response to Mr. Arrow on that question. Yeah, I, I think what's important is uh, obviously there's the socioeconomic or the economic impact of the export, but there's also the identity of America and the, the idea of American soft power throughout the world as people uh, consume our content, our movies, as they visit our cities. 68% of all tourism is for arts and culture activities. When people come here from around the world and they take part in our creative economy, it gives them um, a sense of pride and wonder and awe about the power and strength of America inside their collective imaginations. And then they take that back throughout the world. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank and you, now, thank you. Uh, the, I uh, recognize uh, the gentle lady from New York, Ms. Tenney for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Luke Meyer, and thanks for holding this hearing. Um, and we appreciate the insight and time of the witnesses as well. And I'm honored to represent upstate New York, uh, which has a strong history and culture uh, relating to the arts. I also always wanted to be an artist, but here I am, a politician now. <laughs> now I have a very strong ecosystem of manufacturers, designers, venues that serve artists and musicians in our greater community, including many historic sites. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that my hometown of Utica is where Dick Clark went to school and got his start, and that Funicello of uh, Mouseketeer fame, Joe, Monoma Joe Bonamassa, the great musician, Sawyer Fredericks, uh, and so many others have come from our small city and our, sm our region uh, who have done an amazing job. But uh, another thing is in the manufacturing sector, a lot of people don't realize that the golden artist colors you see when anyone who's an artist knows what they are, were actually started in my district in New Berlin. We say New Berlin, not New Berlin, uh, New York, and uh, have provided a wide range of oil, acrylic, watercolor paints for artists for many years. We also have a lot of printing companies, including my own, but another one I'd like to mention is Curcio Printing in Vestal, New York, where there's a lot of graphic design. And people don't realize I owned a newspaper, but there's a lot of uh, artistic, uh, you know, venues with newspapers, designing ads, designing creative uh, production uh, items for uh, customers. And we did a lot of that. Um, my concern is that in so much of this and what's happened in my community with these great venues and great artists is during the pandemic, these, interest, these industries have suffered. If they've not been designated essential, they were forced to shut down, uh, forced to lose. And thankfully for the PPP program, we were able to get some back. Uh, but a lot of these lockdowns are continuing and even in an unscientific way, which has really put, I think, a real, a real problem with especially a lot of our event spaces, which we have you know, many people who come to perform in our region. And, um, and it concerns me that if we continue with these lockdowns, we aren't going to get uh, these, the reopening and the need for even performance artists, musicians and others to be able to get back on stage and uh, we'll have to rely on remote, uh, remote learning. And as we know, there's nothing like uh, being there in person. Um, so I first wanted to say something, I wanted to ask Mr. Elrod, since you were very passionate about this, and uh, I've heard from a lot of these event space owners uh, about the shutdowns or inability to have consistency in what the rules are and how to enforce those and, and guidance and as how to deal with this. From your experience in um, theater and performance space, do you think uh, that this sort of continuation of this arbitrary decision making and, and um, you know, this process is helping the creative economy? And how would you make a uniform standard so that in everywhere that art, artists perform, whether they're in my community or in New York, uh, they know what's predictable and how to invest so they don't waste money and resources on trying to you know, protect themselves and, they, and their audiences? That, that's a really good question. And thanks for all that prelude. My first professional job was at the Hangar Theater in Ithaca, New York. So I'm familiar with Upstate and it's uh, close and, and dear to me. Um, you know, just anecdotally from my point of view um, and my experience is at the beginning, um, the shutdowns uh, were intended to keep people safe from the transmission of COVID-19. And those government lockdowns did uh, lead to this 15 to 18 month uh, enforced unemployment for so many arts workers. And again, you know, when we talk about um, 
F puck, et cetera. It wasn't that arts workers uh, were lazy and didn't want to go to work. We couldn't. So those were the first rounds of shutdowns. Now, the shutdowns that I'm experiencing, or at least the ones that I'm seeing now, are not necessarily happening because of uh, arbitrary government um, imposition, but because the workforce are getting sick. So like in my neighborhood of Bushwick, Brooklyn, I, I follow everybody on Instagram and I was going to go see a rock and roll concert on New Year's Eve. Well, most of the staff of the venue got sick they shut the venue down. And there's a lot of really cool rock and roll clubs, et cetera, that I love to uh, see. And th they're all just closed because okay. um, yeah. people- Can I reclaim my time? I just want to say it's great. That I, I, okay, you're, so your position is the shutdowns. I want to just ask Ms. Presley, if you could weigh in on that, you know, on inflation and the supply chain, uh, Representative Kim got into that a little bit with you. Can you just uh, it, kind of elaborate? Is it supply, is it just people are sick or is it inflation and supply chain that's affecting your industry? You got 10 uh, well, seconds. <laughs> I have to say it's both. Uh, we certainly have seen increased illness here this last month, uh, but we are hopeful in the next month that we'll see some of that wane. But consumer confidence is still uh, the driver in whether or not our visitors uh, feel safe, uh, both from the virus and, and to travel. Thank you. Gentle ladies, time has expired. And now, the gentle lady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Houlihan is recognized for five minutes. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you so much for the panelists and their testimony today. Uh, this topic is very, very personal to me uh, because my daughter is indeed uh, a director of theater, a professional director of theater. In fact, she worked out at OSF when Bill Rausch was there and Jacob Padron is one of her uh, mentors. And so hello out there to OSF. Uh, the creative economy plays a really large role in my community too, with 296 small businesses uh, involved in the arts, entertainment, recreation within Pennsylvania's sixth congressional district, which is just outside of Philadelphia. And many people have mentioned the Shuttered Venue Operations Grant Program having been a lifeline during this time. But that said, especially with Omicron, I know that many business workers in the creative economy are still especially vulnerable during this public health crisis. As Congress is trying to understand the needs for additional COVID relief, I think we might uh, we need to be smart about improving these programs and learning from the challenges that we've experienced in the programs we've rolled out. Uh, with that said, I've heard from employers in my community like Science Explorers, which is an organization in my district, which has applied for the Paycheck Protection Program grant and the Shuttered Venue Operations Grant. The business reached out to my office to express their frustration because the SVOG process was very complex and they found it to be very time consuming and burdensome. So my question, my first one is to Ms. Nataki Garrett. I understand that, as, that similar to Science Exploring, Explorers that the Oregon Shakespeare Festival also applied for both PPP and SVOG grants. Can you please describe your experiences with the Paycheck Protection Program application compared to the Shuttered Venue Operations Grant Program? Particularly, I'm wondering if there's ways where we could be improving the SVOG program to be streamlined and improved. Uh, thank you for the question. And, um, you know, just to be honest with you, I think the bigger, the biggest problem was that there wasn't enough information. And so our banks didn't have enough information. And so they didn't, they couldn't pass on enough information to us. And then the other thing was the information from the SBA kept shifting. And so we thought we'd have something under control and then we were given something else. And then we had to submit this paper and get this thing done. Um, we had a little bit of, uh, of leeway because we had received some uh, CARES Act funding as well through the state. Um, and so we were, we had a little bit of a buffer, but a lot of my colleagues really suffered in that time waiting for information to be clarified. It was different from state to state um, and it was different actually from, from bank to bank. And so I think streamlining the process would be really beneficial. Um, and especially if, uh, if Congress were to be willing to release the, the 2 billion additional funds that are left over from the SFOG um, back into, um, uh, back into circulation um, to streamline a process so that we could have access to that money um, now that we've already gone through a process would be really, really um, helpful. Thank you. And, I, and my next question is sort of a, a follow on to that to, to Mr. Carson Elrod. Uh, you had mentioned in your testimony that the SVOG grants are a lifeline and that live entertainment venue sector is a small fraction of the large and fragile creative economy at large. 
And so I've heard similar sentiments from businesses like my own Science Explorers, which was ultimately deemed ineligible for SBOG relief, despite having had to cancel 500 programs of their own at the start of the pandemic. How can the SBOG program, assuming that we're able to shake loose some more resources, um, increase or enhance the eligibility requirements to be able to be improving them so that more businesses like that business that I'm mentioning could be able to receive the relief that they need in these challenging times. Is there a way to expand the definition or what would you recommend? I, I recommend doing exactly that. And thank you so much for the question. One of the earliest collaborators we had at Being Arts Hero was Brian Blythe, and he works in uh, John Christensen's uh, costume shop in Manhattan. And he started the Costume Industry Coalition, which represents over 60 uh, you know, highly skilled artisanal workers, and their whole job is to supply costumes to the entire ecosystem of the creative economy. That's cruise lines, operas, rock and roll shows, theater. I mean, they, they are a cornerstone of the creative economy nationally. And they uh, had to closed down completely at the beginning uh, of everything. All of their orders dried up. After the short rounds of PPP, they had to lay everybody off. And they've been essentially doing, um, you know, kind of GoFundMes and charities. And they they were one of the industries that fell through the cracks because the SBOG uh, grants didn't really contemplate the entirety of the creative economy. And it's really important that everybody know that that intervention is a watershed moment in American history between Congress and the creative economy, and there's nobody in the creative economy that isn't appreciative of what Save Our Stages and SBOG represents. But would what would be amazing is to super fund it, expand it, and make sure that it really is a floor for the entirety of the creative economy to get us through this moment and into the next one. Thank you. I appreciate it. My time has run out and I yield back, Madam Chair. The gentle lady's time has expired. And now the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak and thank you the ranking member for having this uh, hearing today. Um, Mr. Elrod, I'm actually gonna, my question was similar to what Mrs. H Ms. Hulhan just asked. By the way, I loved you in uh, Wedding Crashers. Uh, <laughs> but I, I was gonna ask you about the other business. I'm, I'm from Long Island, uh, New York. You know, we have, everybody goes to Broadway. Everybody goes, you know, they come in, they go to, restaurants and whatnot. So we had the restaurant revitalization program that tried to help some of these restaurants, but there are other parts of the creative uh, ecosystem. So you just talked about a, a, a costume supplier. You know, we had a lot of people that were hurt in New York City when when uh, when the film industry and when 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 um, uh, the Broadway was shut down. Can you go a little further what you were just saying? You talked about costume. Who else do we need to expand it to if there was another tranche of money coming? Like who did who was left out? Oh, well, um, I, I think that's one of the things where I would like pivot towards like a GAO report or a congressional commission so that you can hear from more than just four of us to like really get the Brian Blythes of the world in front of you to like really talk about, um, you know, who was there and who uh, who was left out. I think that would be the most important thing to do, because when I think one of the problems is we don't even know what we don't know. As I was saying, the wave has come in and the the damage uh, is not yet knowable. Also, our NAICS codes don't appropriately include the entirety of the creative economy. And so without understanding uh, the fullness of the creative economy, we also don't know who's slipped through the cracks. Yeah, so the dust hasn't completely settled yet and you won't know probably at least until everything's up and running again at full speed. Yeah. What's missing? Okay. I get, I, I understand that. I, I appreciate that. Um, I was in the state legislature. This is for everybody. I was in the state legislature in New York for eight years. Um, New York had a uh, very, uh, very generous, I thought, the tax program to help um, uh, bring movies and, and TV shows to, to the state uh, to get uh, film credits. Um, you know, we, Congress here, we did PPP, we did the uh, Shuttered Venues Operator Grant Program. Um, and there's a couple of people from a couple of different states here. Have has any? Can you talk about what the states have done? Because we also sent them a lot of money to help with more local issues. And you're all, you know, we have Oregon, I think, and, uh, and Missouri and, and New York. Has this? Has any of those states done anything uh, since the co since COVID, uh, since the pandemic shut everything down, to help uh, your industries? In addition to what okay. the Congress has done, but Ms. Garrett. 
Thank you very much for the question. Yes, so uh, very early in the pandemic, um, a group of arts organizations that were um, uh, much more highly resourced than some of our smaller organizations got together and um, lobbied for uh, CARES Act funding. So we received as a, as a coalition of uh, performing arts theaters, um, uh, performing arts venues, uh, that's a ballet, the symphony, the opera, OSF and another theater called Portland Center Stage. Uh, we lobbied for $8 million in, um, in CARES Act funding. And that was actually the thing that buoyed us and, and actually brought me to um, lobby for, uh, with the uh, uh, Professional Nonprofit Theater Coalition, lobby for access to SBOG funding. So once we knew we could do it, we did it again. Um, and, and we were really grateful for the CARES Act funding. We, we talked to some of our other colleagues across the country to try to help them figure out ways to lobby for some of, some of those resources. Um, in these times, every little dime, every little bit counts. Um, I also wanted to um, go back to your, your question to Carson. Um, there are a lot of theater are workers who are not recognized as such, carpenters, stitchers, ushers. A lot of those folks um, are only uh, paid when shows are running. And so they weren't uh, necessarily uh, affected by industry specific funds. And so being, being really clear about the full impact across the industry, you know, our ushers work every single time a show goes up and they're just as important as the people who stand on stage, but there was no way to, to fund them um, except for through unemployment uh, during the, the pandemic. And that, that's, those are things that we have to think about. Whereas when we, you know, when we did do the streaming of the shows, we paid everybody who, everybody was a part of those productions. We paid every single person, um, but, but we weren't able to pay the ushers mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the carpenters did not receive any kind of funding for that, so. Ms. Elrod, you uh, said you wanted to answer further answer something else. Oh, yeah, I, it, basically exactly what Ms. Garrett said is I was thinking of the small business committee. So I think I was thinking of small businesses, but I forgot to leave out the, the, the real group of people that's been left out are the arts workers themselves. And that's why expanded unemployment is important. That's why something like the Creative Economy Revitalization Act, which would give money directly to uh, arts workers to ply their trade and bring them into the public sphere and make festivals and murals and public works of arts and the Arts Education for All Act. There's so many things that are uh, in front of Congress right now that would that would help so many of those people that have fallen through. And uh, I was I was embarrassed that it slipped my mind. Of course, the arts workers themselves are the most important people that have kind of been left out of the equation. Thanks. The gentleman's time has expired. And uh, we have now reached to the end of our member questions. So I will now do my closing statement. Um, I wanna thank our panel again for being here today. Your stories of persevering through the pandemic demonstrate the, the resilience and fortitude of your industry, but it's very clear that you still face many challenges today. For our economy to fully recover, we must work together to overcome the hardships and challenges facing the creative economy. Unfortunately, we can't reverse the damage overnight. It will take sustained support and investment to bring these businesses back to where they once were. We must work together to advance policies that drive recovery in the near term and pave the way for future success. The American creative economy is one of our most significant resources and we can't afford to leave it behind. With that, I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. And if there's no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>